the Breguet BR690 series was a product of Breguet's attempt to compete in the 1934 French Air Force tender for a twin-engine, three-seat fighter. Breguet, finding the weight requirements a bit too demanding, decided to just ignore them, because why bother with rules when you can wing it? Unsurprisingly, Breguet lost to Potez and their Potez 630, which actually played by the rules. But Breguet, ever the optimist, saw promise in their rejected design. They decided to continue developing it using their own funds. The result? A twin-seat attack bomber that, instead of the original monoplane, was actually somewhat useful. In October 1934, the Service Technique de l'Aéronautique, STAE, put out a tender for a twin-engine, two- to three-seat, multi-purpose fighter armed with cannons. Its role would be to command single-engine fighters, provide long-range bomber escort, and perform night interception duties. Basically, the Swiss Army knife of airplanes. Five companies submitted designs. Breguet, BR-690, Henriot, H-220, later taken over by SNCAC and renamed NC-600, Loire Neopore, LN-20, Romano, Romano-110, and Potez Potez 630. The BR-690 designed by Georges Ricard featured a cantilever mid-wing configuration. Compact and capable, it still looked a bit odd. The fuselage was a rotund affair, narrowing sharply halfway back, which gave it the appearance of a catfish, a big-headed, tapering-tailed creature that looked like it belonged in a pond rather than the skies. The aircraft's armament included two 20mm HS-404 cannons in the nose and a 7.5mm Mach-1934 machine gun in the rear seat for self-defense. To power the catfish, Breguet chose two Hispano Suiza 14AB02-03 engines producing 680 horsepower each, with propellers rotating inward to reduce torque and make it easier to handle if one engine decided to give up the ghost. Despite the Air Force only officially confirming the production contract for the BR-690 prototype on March 26, 1937, Breguet, confident they'd win over Potez 630, had already started building the prototype two years earlier. Unfortunately, confidence doesn't get engines delivered on time. Due to a 10-month delay in getting the Hispano Suiza engines, the BR-690 prototype didn't take its first flight until March 23, 1938 about a year after Potez had already flown their Potez 630 and secured a production contract. Timing is everything, and Breguet's was spectacularly bad. Despite the delays, the prototype was handed over to the Centre d'Essai du Matériel Aérien, CEMA, at Villa Coublet in July 1938 for further testing. Remarkably, the BR-690 performed brilliantly surpassing the Potez 630 in several areas. But, alas, Potez had already made itself cozy with the Air Force. Not willing to let a perfectly good, albeit late, plane go to waste, the Air Force placed an order for 100 units of the BR-691AB2 attack bomber on June 14, 1938. And this is where things started to get even more complicated. Converting the BAR-690 into an attack bomber turned out to be a lot more trouble than expected. Who could have guessed that stuffing a bomb bay into a plane that wasn't designed for one would be difficult? The solution? Remove the navigator. Bomb bay or navigator? You can't have both. In the end... The right side cannon was kept, while the left one was swapped for two 7.5 mm machine guns. All weapons could be depressed 15 degrees for easier strafing, which at least made for some versatility. 
Other modifications included a redesigned landing gear, moving the oil cooler air intake from the wing to above the engine nacelles, and increasing fuel capacity from 705 liters to 985 liters. The initial batch of BR691 was equipped with 700 horsepower Hispano Suiza, 14 AB10-11 engines, but from the 101st unit onward, Breguet planned to use the slightly more powerful 745 horsepower 14 AB12-13 engines. The planes were fitted with three blade variable pitch propellers, either Radier for the first 50 or Hamilton for the rest because who doesn't love a little inconsistency in production? Compared to other French aircraft manufacturers, Breguet actually managed to be relatively efficient in organizing production. The prototype BR-691 had its maiden flight on March 22, 1939, and the first production model flew just eight weeks later on May 15. However, Due to reliability issues with the Hispano Suiza 14 AB engines, Breguet decided to switch to the larger Gnome Rhone 14 M engines. Thus, the 19th production unit became the guinea pig for the engine swap and was redesignated as the BR 693 No. 1, taking its first flight on October 25, 1939. By November 24, Breguet handed it over to SEMA for evaluation, which confirmed that while its performance matched the BAR-691, its reliability was significantly better. Finally, the Air Force decided to prioritize production of the BR-693 over the BR-691. The last BR-691, number 78, rolled off the line, and the first BR-693 had its maiden flight on March 2, 1940. The Breguet 693 AB2 was never going to win a beauty contest, but it sure had a personality. With a wingspan of 15.4 meters, a length of 9.7 meters, and a height of 3.2 meters, it was like a flying loaf of French bread. Stocky, functional, and built for a very specific purpose. Weighing in at 3,006 kilograms empty and 4,892 kilograms fully loaded, the Breguet 693 wasn't exactly lightweight, but what it lacked in elegance, it made up for in firepower. Under the hood, well, more like under the cowlings, were two Gnome Rhone 14M engines, one on each wing. The 700 horsepower, 14 cylinder, air cooled radial engines were known as the 14M6, left, and 14M7, right. Thanks to these trusty land gods, as Gnome Rhone liked to call them, the chunky bomber could reach a top speed of 490 kilometers per hour at 5,000 meters. The service ceiling was an impressive 9,500 meters high enough for a lovely view, before anti-aircraft fire brought you back down. The range was 1,350 kilometers, perfect for those round trips to drop off a payload of high explosives and wave a cheery bonjour to the enemy. The Breguet 693 was armed to the teeth. The bomb bay could hold 400 kilograms of bombs, usually configured as eight 50-kilogram bombs. To help the crew actually see what they were bombing, large sheets of plexiglass were embedded in the bomb bay doors. Up front, the aircraft sported an array of guns that screamed, I'm compensating for something. In the nose were two Mac 1934 7.5-millimeter machine guns, each with 100 rounds mounted on the left side and one Hispano Suiza HS40420 mm cannon on the right, loaded with 60 rounds. 
it was a respectable amount of firepower to make sure any enemy unlucky enough to cross paths with the 693 had a really bad day. At the rear, a flexible Mac 1934 7.5mm machine gun, also loaded with 100 rounds, offered some semblance of self-defense. The Breguet 693's operation was handled by a two-person crew, the pilot and the flight engineer also rear gunner. Lack of sufficient aircraft engines was the biggest headache for French aviation in the months leading up to World War II. In desperation, the Air Ministry asked Breguet and every other aircraft manufacturer in France to modify their planes to use any engine they could find, even if it meant strapping on British or American engines like some kind of desperate mix-and-match project. This led to the Breguet 690 No. 1 being fitted with two American-made Pratt and Whitney SB4G twin WASP 14-cylinder radial engines, each putting out 825 horsepower and subsequently being redesignated as the Breguet 695. Once the war kicked off, the Breguet 693 got its first taste of real action, and let's just say it wasn't exactly the heroic spectacle the French had envisioned. The French military, in their infinite wisdom, had run pre-war tests and concluded that low-level bombing and strafing were far superior to dive bombing mostly because they didn't have small-caliber automatic cannons at the time. The Breguet 693 was designed based on these conclusions, with armor insufficient to protect against modern, low-altitude anti-aircraft fire. Spoiler alert! This design oversight didn't end well. During the Battle of France, more than half of the aircraft were lost. The first unit of GBAE-54 began receiving production models of the BR-691 in October 1939, with the rest of the squadron following suit. The Air Force decided to form the 6th Attack Group from the 51st and 54th Attack Wings, but apparently organizing a military force in wartime is harder than it sounds. By April 15, 1940, they gave up on this new group, reverting back to their previous structure and forming the 18th Attack Group, GBA I-54 and GBA II-54, and the 19th Attack Group, GBA I-51 and GBA II-51. Meanwhile, the BR-693 started rolling into service, and the 18th Attack Group wasted no time swapping out their old BR-691 for these improved flying contraptions. On May 10, 1940, when Germany began its blitzkrieg against France and the Low Countries, the French Air Force had precisely 19 Breguet 691 and 38 693 ready for action. Meanwhile, Air Force warehouses held another 20 BR, 691, and 9 BR, 693. On the night of May 12th, 12 Breguet 693 from GBAI-54 flew the aircraft's first combat mission, attacking German ground forces along the tongres luce warems line. Unfortunately, poor tactics led to a disastrous outcome. Eight of the planes were shot down by German anti-aircraft fire over the target, and two more crashed on the way home. Only two aircraft made it back safely. I think we can all agree that's not a great ratio. With the Germans advancing rapidly, GBA I-54 pulled out of Montdidier and relocated to Atoms, while GBA II-54 moved from Roy to Bretigny on May 16th. At the same time, the 19th Attack Group, now equipped with Breguet 693 and Potez 63, moved from Royes to Bretigny on May 16th, 633, relocated from Etampes to Briar 
and attacked German forces in the Arras Cambrai Bapaume area on May 20th with 14 Breguet 693. When the Germans launched a major offensive along the Somme River on June 5th, the Breguet 693 managed to inflict significant damage on German armored units, losing only three aircraft in the process. For once, things went sort of right. Despite the French military's courageous resistance, the Germans, using their new, highly effective tactics, were firmly in control of the battlefield. On June 22nd, the day the armistice was signed between France and Germany, the Breguet 693 of the French Air Force were still carrying out combat missions north of Poitiers and at Châtellerault. On June 23rd, all assault bomber units were ordered to cease resistance and head to toulouse francazal in the south to await further orders. Throughout the Battle of France, the Breguet aircraft flew over 500 missions, achieving some success, but also enduring devastating losses. In total, 25 Breguet 691, 79 Breguet 693, and two Breguet 695 were lost for various reasons. More than half of the 205 Breguet delivered to the Armée de l'Air. Production of the series continued until German forces occupied the factories in Villa Couble and Bourges, at which point Breguet had produced 75 Breguet 691, 224 Breguet 693, and 50 Boulevard Sex Sivfem. Some of the surviving BR-693 had their engines stripped by the Germans, who repurposed them for their Henschel H's 129 ground attack aircraft. The Germans even ordered the completion of several unfinished Breguet aircraft after the armistice, and these planes were used as advanced trainers. After the armistice, the Vichy authorities were allowed to maintain a small air force in mainland France. Assault bomber pilots occasionally flew training flights in the BR-693 and BR-695, presumably trying to keep themselves sharp. After Case Anton, the full German occupation of France in late 1942, some surviving aircraft in the Italian occupation zone were transferred to Italy, but never used. The story of the Bar 690 series is a classic tale of French wartime aviation. Ambitious designs, technical hiccups, bureaucratic delays, and ultimately, a product that arrived just in time to be a little too late. Breguet's BR 690 was a catfish that briefly soared in the skies, only to eventually be forgotten in the wake of a rapidly changing wartime landscape. It's a reminder that even in the midst of chaos, sometimes a weird-looking plane with some quirks can still find a place in history, even if that place is mostly remembered as a footnote in a long list of almost but not quite aircraft. <laughs>